You know, occasionally I get some critiques on these videos, but one critique that definitely is one that I agree with is that they say, John, you build a lot of tanks on this channel. However, I notice that you don't really build anything Russian. To which I gotta say, I'm guilty as charged on that. You're absolutely right. I do have quite a deficiency in Russian tank builds. So you know what? Let's go ahead. I'm gonna put it on record right now and say we're gonna change that. Let's go ahead and introduce some borscht into our diet. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale Russian Joseph Stalin III heavy tank. The model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information will be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. The model is built predominantly out of the box. However, I went ahead and made some small modifications and improvements to the build in a number of locations. We'll be going over all of these modifications as well as the kit features in this video. In addition to all of that, I'm going to be giving this model a thorough inbox review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a ton of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this is a vehicle that has many different names depending on who you ask. This vehicle is the Soviet or the Russian JS-3, IS-3, Joseph Stalin-3, or the Joseph Stalin-3. All of those names are the exact same thing and it's just more or less semantics and it depends on who you ask. Regardless of the name nomenclature, this vehicle was a very important tank design in terms of Russian tank development. The JS-3 was a heavy tank that was developed by the Soviet Union at the tail end of World War II. This vehicle was going to encompass many new design features that were going to be carried over and were going to become a hallmark on Soviet tank designs from this point all the way forward throughout the remainder of the Cold War and even up until very recently with the adaptation of the T-14 Armada. The JS-3 was the Soviet's answer to the new German heavy tanks that were being fielded during World War II. Of course, this would be the Tiger I and later the King Tiger. At this point, you can tell that the Russians weren't screwing around anymore and they wanted to have a tank that was going to have enough armor protection that can defeat just basically anything that was thrown at it. In combination of some excellent armor protection. It was also going to be armed with a very heavy caliber ordnance, which was going to be suitable at dealing with those German heavy tanks that I just mentioned. Prior to the JS-3, the Soviet heavy tank was known as the Joseph Stalin 1 or the JS-2 that it came immediately afterward. The JS-2 was really utilizing many of these new ideas and concepts, namely the main armament caliber, as well as also the concept of a very heavily armored tank design. However, where the JS-3 departed was with its overall exterior design. It was a complete departure compared to the vehicles that came beforehand and was very different. As opposed to the JS-2, which more or less was a design evolution, you could say from the KV series, that Joseph Stalin III was going to utilize an entirely new concept, which was going to be focusing primarily on a low silhouette and also a very sloped and angular hull and turret armor appearance. The one thing that the JS-3 did share in commonality with its predecessors was with the engine as well as also with the suspension and the running gear. Those were lifted directly from the previous vehicles and carried over into the new design because basically they worked very well and those components were already in full production. Where the JS-3 was very different was with, of course, like I just mentioned, its armor protection. The front section was iconic because it had the pike nose. With this severe angled shape on the front glasses, this gave it excellent armor protection and was able to cause massive deflection on just about any rounds that were going to be coming towards the front section. The turret retained an all cast type appearance, which was again a uh, technology that the Russians used to great effect during World War II on vehicles like the T-34 and also on the Joseph Stalin II. However, rather than going with the 
elongated type turret like on the other vehicles it had this ufo upside down bowl type feature to it the turret itself had phenomenal thickness in its overall armor protection and again this with its lower profile gave it excellent armor protection and was again intended to be used for deflection of enemy rounds that were coming inbound this was also one of the first Russian tank designs to really also focus on lowering the tank silhouette. This was something that was learned by the Russians, or I should say observed by the Russians, where they noticed that their tanks were being hit at certain ranges because of the height. By lowering the height of the vehicle, this made the vehicle much harder to hit, which also improved its survivability. And again, this is something that would become more or less a hallmark on Soviet tank designs, from the post-World War II time frame, such as the T-55, T-62, and of course the T-72. The tank's armament was the same 122mm D-25 main armament that was carried over from the JS-2. This was one of the best anti-tank weapons that the Russians had at that time, and was more than capable at knocking out just about anything being fielded by not just the Germans, but basically anyone else during that time frame. Unfortunately, one side effect of the unique shape of the turret was the rounds limiting feature that was going to be held on the tank's internal magazines. In total, about 28 rounds of ammunition was held inside for both armor piercing as well as high explosives. So the vehicle was going to have a somewhat limited operational capacity, but this was something that the Russians deemed appropriate and was going to better fit with their doctrine from the late period of the war and moving on forward. In addition to the main armament, the vehicle also had a coax MG and a turret mounted anti-aircraft MG, which was going to be the DSHK. One thing that was eliminated that was present on the JS-2 was the rear mounted MG. This was something that was found on the back portion of the turret and it wasn't deemed necessary to carry over into the JS-3 design. The vehicles entered into production in 1945, but production ceased in 1947. In total, about 2,000 units and change were produced, and unfortunately, just like with the story of many other of the late war Allied tank designs, this one came far too late to see service during World War II. However, that's not the end of the story of the JS-3, because this vehicle did see much service with the Soviet military, post-World War II and was issued out to several other Warsaw Pact countries. Aside from that, one of the actual combat usage that the JS-3 was utilized in was in the Middle East where it saw service against the Israelis. And during those engagements, the Israelis actually had some difficulty with their M48 patents in trying to knock out one of these Russian heavy tanks. So this vehicle was definitely something that would have been a severe threat if ever encountered on the battlefield, specifically during this time frame. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, we'll be utilizing this 135th scale Tamiya JS-3 Stalin heavy tank kit. The Tamiya JS-3, this is one kit in particular that I always had a soft spot for because it was such an interesting release to the marketplace, specifically when it first came out back in 1996. Which, by the way, opens up an in interesting conundrum. Does this count as a vintage kit? Because, I mean, the kit itself is pushing close to 30 years old now, but Tamiya has kept it in full-scale production since its release. So, I'll let people debate that in the comments section. Regardless, that doesn't take away that this kit was a very, very, very nice release. Prior to the release of this kit here, there was a complete vacuum and void in the hobby and in the marketplace for a JS3 Stalin. To put things in perspective, prior to the release of this kit here, there were really only two JS3s that were made in plastic up until that point. The first was a 148 scale kit from Aurora, which by the way, I've done a model showcase video one, check it out. And the second was made by Tamiya themselves, but that was back in the late 1960s, and that vehicle was rendering the T10 variant of the JS3. And on top of that, because that vehicle was made in the late 1960s, it was more or less a toyish type model, as opposed to something with, you know, contemporary tooling, specifically of the 90s period. 
And although this kit was released in the 90s, just like with many of the older Dragon kits that I frequently review on this channel, this kit here, in my opinion, has aged very, very well. And it's still a viable option today, which is probably why Tamiya has kept it in production for as long as they have. In fact, Tamiya have taken many of the components found in this kit here and recycled them by spinning them off and using them on other releases that came out in the years that followed. Such two examples would be the Joseph Stalin II kit as well as their ISU. And because these kits have been in production for as long as they have and Tamiya's distribution is as good as it is, tracking one of these kits down is a very easy endeavor. And when found, they can be had for some really affordable prices. Anywhere between 24 to about 45 US dollars is generally where you tend to see these kits retail at. And of course, being a Tamiya kit, you could find them in just about any location where you typically find models from your local hobby shop, mail order, eBay, Amazon, swap meet, <laughs> flea market, you name it, tracking one of these kits down is still extremely relatively easy. Now, as for this particular kit here, this one I didn't acquire it or pay any of those prices because this one here was actually given to me as a gift. The person who had this model was actually one of my viewers and he is one of the people who I've built tanks for in the past. We've became very good friends over the years and he had a few models sitting in his stash that he wasn't doing anything with, so he decided to just send them my way, see, you know, if I could do something with it or for it to enhance my own collection, which, of course, I obliged. The model has been sitting in my stash now for about four or five years, so if you're watching this, uh, you know, I, I finally got to it. <laughs> and it has been collecting a little bit of dust, as you can see, nothing too egregious, but still, it's going to feel good to actually crack this one open and get it started. So with the cover now de-dusted, let's go ahead and go over the artwork and the graphic design. Here we have the JS3 right there in the foreground. Of course, this is your standard Tamiya type illustration, which means the tank is very nicely rendered, but it's behind a simple white background. The details of the rendering are very nicely illustrated, like I just mentioned. You can see all the appropriate nooks and crannies and on the track and on the row wheels. The DSHK is prominently rendered right there, and the tank commander is sitting in the hatch, which, by the way, it always reminded me of Robert Mitchum every single time I would see this box art. Other than that, the remainder of the graphic design is typical for Tamiya. We have that uber cool Tamiya typeface, which has been used on their models forever now. The main title right there, JS3 Stalin, and the usual verbiage about modeling skills, glues, all that good stuff. Some information written here in Japanese. To me, a logo right there on the lower corner. And right here on the side, we have here the ubiquitous Tamiya little side illustrations where we have some of the marking options for this model. Of course, very nicely rendered, along with Robert Mitchum again. Here you can see the date that these kits originally came out in 1996. Of course, they are made in the Philippines. Tamiya headquarters is in Japan, but their manufacturing is all done in the Philippines these days. Moving to the side tab, quite typical for these Tamiya kits. This is MM211. And on the opposite side here, we have a little bit more verbiage. We have a top little illustration of the vehicle, some stuff written in Japanese, probably a little brief history. And what's really cool, they actually went to a Eastern, U Eastern European tank museum and were able to take many photographs, which went into the development of this kit here. And that's one of the, I believe, the vehicle that they use for research. All right, cracking open the box, we'll reveal the kit contents. And what you're gonna get here is a bare bones plastic model kit. Everything is injection molded polystyrene with the exception of the tracks. You're not gonna have in here any sort of modern amenities that are found on more modern tooling kits, such as photo etch, brass barrels, workable track links. None of that stuff. This is as old school as you can get. So the parts are all molded in this dark green or drabby type plastic, which is something that Tamiya has used for a long time, although the colors have changed over the years, but by and large, you know, it's the same type of stuff. The quality of the tooling, of course, is excellent. It's a Tamiya kit after all, so the detail is going to be nice and crisp, yet at the same time, the assembly is going to be fairly straightforward. See the hatches? Note the detailing found on the spare track links. The ammo can for the DSHK. 
exhaust manifolds. The Dushka itself is also very nicely rendered. They went with the 1930 something pattern version. I'm sorry, my Dushka uh, vernacular is not as sharp as my M2s, but this is the early type with the rotary mag or the rotary belt feed system that's found right there on the top. And again, Tamiya did a exquisite job with the rendering. Note the flash suppressor is hollowed out. And again, overall fantastic quality. The hatch has some cast texturing on it. And again, you know, nice details overall. Oh, th over here, these two sections are alignment jigs for the suspension, which is going to be important in order to get everything properly lined up. We'll be touching upon that as the build goes on. This runner here, it's a dual runner setup where it's the same runner but mirrored so that you have, or not mirrored, but just duplicated, so you have all of the suspension components present. Here you can see the road wheels. Note the quality of the molding on all the little rigidity ribs found on those wheels. I believe they even have a little bit of cast texturing. It's hard to tell through the plastic. There goes the drive sprocket. bump stops, fuel canisters, hooks, swing arms, you know, basically all the amenities right here. It's funny, most of the kit is actually consisted of these two runners. Shows you how efficient they are with designing their kits. Here we go, the final drives. Also, unlike many of the other older Tamiya kits, this one here was never intended to be motorized. So on the sprockets, you do not have those little hexagon-shaped objects in order to propel the, the sprocket with the gearbox. And on the lower hull, there are no gearbox or battery amenities that are, again, found on older kits like the Patton or the T62. Bringing us now to the upper hull. Again, exquisite detailing found here on the rear engine grills. Most of the details are integrally molded on, and you know, to me it does a good job with, with the simplification of their models, but at the same time still keeping the detailing pretty good. Note the weld beads found on the appropriate locations. On the pike nose, you got little fasteners on the side tin work, Oop, I mean on the front tin work. And on the turret, we have some excellent, excellent texturing found on this section here, which if anyone has seen a real JS3 before, I can really tell you the thing literally looks like a boulder on tracks. And to me, it really nailed that boulder look. One thing that's nice about this texturing is that even after you paint it, the texturing still comes through. And this is something that's a challenge on a lot of plastic kits out there where they have, and to me included, where they have the texturing molded in, but it's so fine that even with a couple layers of thin paint, it really tends to cover it up. With the texturing on this here, from what I've seen on my past Joseph Stalin's rebuild, because this is not the first time I built this kit, uh, spoiler alert. If anyone has watched the videos on the channel, you'll know that. Uh, you will see that even with the layers of paint, the texturing still does come out in a you know fairly straightforward manner. Finally, on the bottom of the box, here we have the lower hull. Lower hull is very nicely detailed with the appropriate geometry sections. Note on the swing arm, Housing, you see the well beads present, the axis panels with the fasteners. A little bit more cast sectioning right here on the front armor section. But one thing that this kit does have, and it's one that I just, for the longest time, eluded to me a kit, is that there are no sponsors. And this is probably the weakest point, in my opinion, of this whole kit. But that is something I am going to be taking care of. Oh, one interesting thing that this kit does have, as a kid I didn't understand it, but you see these two fastener locations right here on the lower hull. These are so you can actually secure the model to a diorama base. And this is something that Tamiya was playing around with. They don't supply you any fasteners or hardware with the kit here, but they just have these molded in. I guess it was an idea they had that never went anywhere. Uh, this design would come back later on, on the M26 Pershing kits that they have, where they have that, that funky working 
not working, but working suspension so that you can tighten these bolts here and contort the suspension to whatever terrain you're putting the tank on. Uh, I think this kit here, they were probably thinking along those lines, but for one reason or another, it never came to fruition. Uh, that's also why on this kit here, the swing arms need to have that jig to line them up because uh, the swing arms do not have like a half section molded in to keep them permanently aligned in the, in the static position. Digging down further takes to the instructions, typical Tamiya with the graph design typography. We have a nice little brief history of the vehicle. Usual Tamiya instructions, which are always some of the best I've seen. And what's really cool is that like on the back you have stuff like this where you have a nice little pseudo anime <laughs> Japanese hand drawn diagram of the vehicle compared to the King Tiger, Panther, you know, all that good stuff. So again, it's one of those things you typically find on Japanese kits and you know, showmanship always is a, a, a hallmark done on these Japanese models. On the bottom of the box, we have here the track bands. Being a Tamiya kit from this era, the tracks are made from a single piece vinyl material, which sadly to say is not the case anymore with Tamiya kits. They, I don't know, have the, the smart idea of thinking people unironically like Lincoln Length, which they don't. And uh, so modern Tamiya kits, yeah, I kind of have a problem with them, but that's a topic for another video. Uh, these tracks here are made with excellent type materials where we have some really good molding details found on the inner hinge sections and of course the outer sections are equally as nicely rendered. This is quite typical for Tamiya kits for the longest time from uh, starting from the 90s time period working all the way up to well what would have been present day. It wasn't until recently Tamiya decided to switch out this medium which was a mistake. Anyway, uh, on the bottom of the box, we have here a set of water slide decals. You have the options to render this vehicle in two types of formats. And the decal quality is I'm probably not going to be surprised. It's going to be typical to me. So you have that blue paper backing. These are water slide decals, but in the past, I've had always really good results with the quality of decals found to me at kit. So this model here, I'm not predicting anything different. Starting with the suspension, all of the components that you see here are stocked with the Tamiya kit and get installed without any sort of complications. The Tamiya kit is a very well engineered piece and as long as you pay attention to which swing arms go where, you shouldn't have any problems with the alignment. As we saw before, the kit does supply you with those really nifty alignment jigs which are really handy to make sure that the suspension is held at the proper height which is crucial to ensure that the tank sits on an even keel. Also as I just referenced the swing arm components for the remainder of the suspension and the unit here in the front are actually two different components and they are actually very well labeled and illustrated in the Tamiya instructions as well as also are equally as well marked on the sprues themselves. However, this is something that I do want to mention because this is one of those things where if the builder's not paying attention and are just going through the motions, they can easily go ahead and install the components in the improper locations. The parts can just be swapped out, so this is something that the builder needs to pay attention to. This is specifically crucial because a lot of individuals, when they're deburring and removing components that are duplicates off of the sprue, i.e. swing arms, they tend to do so in one fell swoop and they can easily mix up these two components with one another. They look similar to one another, but they are indeed different. And just to make sure everyone gets the point, here you can see the swing arms found on the remainder of the suspension. Note they are cylindrical in shape, while the one here on the front is a box type structure. Again, all this information is well illustrated and marked on the instructions and on the runners themselves. And again, it's something that can easily be misinterpreted or improperly installed by the builder. So this is one of the aspects of the kit that the builder really needs to pay attention to. Outside of that, the remainder of the run year was a dream to put together. The wheels go together very easily. The Return rollers are also a very easy installation, and the sprockets themselves are also very, well, easily assembled. This is going to be a recurring theme you're going to see in this video. The one thing that I do want to mention, and this is something that does come up, and it's a question I get asked from time to time from people who watch my videos, is 
Does this tank have a pushable feature to it? And the answer is yes, but really no. The row wheels are not like the older Tamiya kits where they had those rubber poly caps in them so that you can secure them to the model and then they can still spin. On this model over here, this is something that you would see on a lot of other Tamiya kits of the 90s period where although the tracks are single piece vinyl and the sprockets have a poly cap on them, the remaining row wheels themselves are meant to be permanently glued on in place. And that is exactly the method that you see here. Because of that, the wheels will not roll when pushed. However, the track will still be able to be pushable, although it's going to be a little weird pushing the track without the row wheels rolling with the model in motion. As for the tracks, obviously the kit supplied single piece vinyl tracks were going to be utilized and they are excellent. It's a real shame that Tamiya are able to produce tracks like this, but have chosen to move away from them in favor of the dreaded and flawed individual Lincoln length. As for these ones here, they are excellent. They have nice detailing on them, they assemble very well, and once fitted to the model, looked apart without any sort of problems. The tracks themselves, like I always mention in these videos, are painted with Tamiya acrylics. As I often mention, you do not want to use enamel or spray paint type paints in order to paint your single piece tracks, be it from Tamiya, Italeri, or any other type of make. Depending on the formula, the spray paints can potentially harm the tracks and lead them to either fall apart when the paint is applied or possibly just lead to dry rot and the tracks disintegrating as the model ages, neither of which is beneficial. For this model here, I always, and also for my other models that is, I like to use Tamiya acrylics for the main coat, and it's just standard Tamiya flat black. It's applied via the airbrush, and then once the paint is applied and is on a thorough manner, the remainder of the weathering is added with both dry brushing as well as airbrushing. Once the worn and distressed look is added, the track weathering is complete and is then secured in place. The track bands are connected with a small little drop of super glue on the corresponding locations and the super glue bonds very very well with the type of vinyl material that Tamiya utilized on their single piece tracks during the 1990s time frame. This is true for not just this particular kit here, but the same is also applicable for their Panther and their Yag Panther kits as well as again the other kits from that same era. When installing the track on this model, I always found it best to install it with the return rollers mounted on partially. What I mean by that is first the model is thoroughly painted and weathered, and at the very tail end it's time to install the road wheels. Well, I first install the rear portion of the return rollers in place, and then the track gets fitted to the model. Once the track and the row wheels are fitted, I then take the outer portion of the idlers and just secure them in place. This is an easy way to do the installation because you don't have to navigate and try to force the track teeth to slide over these wheels over here, which can potentially cause problems with chipping paint and other things that are just not really beneficial. By doing it with the method I just mentioned, it goes together much more easily, simpler, and just it makes for a better build in the end. On that note, another bit of detailing that's always added at the very tail end of these Stalin builds is the little mud scoop that we have right over here found just aft of the sprocket. With the way this piece is designed, if you try to install this component before the sprocket is fitted in place, you're just going to lead to the part getting broken repeatedly. So this again is one of those items that are one of the final bits of detailing that get added to your Stalin build, be it from Tamiya. Dragon or Trumpeter, depending on the vehicle. If it's a Joseph Stalin tank family vehicle, install this piece at the tail end and you will thank me for that. While on the suspension, one thing I do want to mention is with the row wheels themselves. Of course, the Stalin is just like the KV family of vehicles. In fact, it's evolved from the KV. But regardless, on these patterns of vehicle, the wheels are not rubber rimmed and are steel rimmed, much along the lines as you'll see on like a German tank, specifically like a King Tiger type vehicle. Regardless, for the wheels themselves, you'll see that all of the tire face sections have been painted in silver paint, and the same is true for not just the main row wheels, the idler, but also true for the return rollers as well. This is an easy way to add a little bit of extra life to your build, as opposed to forgetting that and just leaving everything painted in the base coat. Obviously, these pieces here get worn very quickly once the vehicle is in operation. And again, while on this section over here, one really cool, interesting bit of detailing on the Stalin is this little 
access drain cap found right over there. The detailing is integrally molded on, and during the weathering portion, you'll notice I added a little bit of black and some gloss lacquer to that section over there, just to give that nice, sweaty, oily look, which is something that always looks good as a bit of detailing on these military models. The very last thing I want to mention before we depart from the lower section is with the Sponson, or in this case, the lack thereof one. As I touched upon before, the biggest ding on the Tamiya Joseph Stalin 3 kit is that the Sponsons are completely absent. Well, on this kit here, I went ahead and addressed that. On the model, I fabricated brand new Sponson sections out of panels of sheet styrene and I actually have a tutorial on how this was done. It's not going to be found in this video but it's found in the other Timia Joseph Stalin 3 old tank repair video that I've recently posted on the ECA channel. Listed below in the description you will see the actual timestamp where I go over this information on how the panels here were fabricated and secured in place. Once those sections are secured, it always makes the build much more robust, more solid feeling, and it just makes for a better build in general, as opposed to leaving the sections sponsorless. Finally, we can depart from the suspension, and this leads us to the rear engine deck. All the details you see here are stock Tamiya and went on without any sort of problems. The one thing that I do want to mention is with the kit supplied tow cables, these are, well, kit supplied and are done in the same way as are seen on many other Tamiya military vehicle kits, where we have the eyelets that are made out of plastic and then the kit supplies you with a length of nylon string that are used for the actual cables themselves. The system does work very well and in the instructions they do have a nice little illustration that shows you the length of the string that needs to be in order to get the appropriate length required for the model. And if you follow the instructions, they go together very well. When assembling them, you want to again be careful to make sure that the string isn't fraying on the ends, which is something that can hurt the look of the build. And also the other thing you want to pay attention to is how to paint them. Painting string like this is actually a bit of a trick in its own right and it does take a little bit of experience to make sure that the string isn't too thick with the paint and still has some flexibility to it but it's also thoroughly painted and weathered. The string themselves was all spray painted along with the eyelets once they were all glued together and then from there I went ahead and weathered them to the configuration that you see here. The weathering is done with a mixture of both airbrush as well as dry brushing much along the same lines as I mentioned before with the tracks but just you know with a different application. One thing that I did on this build over here to give it just a little bit of extra color pop is you'll notice that the cables themselves are painted with a different color of green compared to the remainder of the vehicle. This is a way to add some more color pop to the model as opposed to just painting everything with the same color. It's one of those little quick little modeling tricks that just adds a little bit extra life and character to the build. On fitting them in place, they do go on fairly well. However, one thing that the builder does have to pay attention to is that the, the string tends to be a little bit overly flexible. And so you are going to have to anchor it down in certain locations in order to get it with the finalized look you see here. This is done with some very thin super glue that is applied in a very precise manner. I have to mention that because the thin super glue has a really bad habit of running all over the place if the builder is not up to tune on their skill sets in working with this type of media. Once everything is applied and is anchored down, you'll have the look that you see here, which does add quite a bit of focal point to the rear section of the vehicle. Also, I just want to mention that the cables are not something that you must have, so if you are working on one of these models and you're a beginner and you don't really have the skill sets required to fit these in place or if you well were like me when I was younger and didn't really care for the cables too much you can emit them on the build and still be perfectly fine. On the cables themselves you do also not only have the eyelets but you have the ratchet mechanisms that are right here and here and again these are all kits applied they're well documented in the instructions but if you are going to emit the cables you emit them as well. In addition to the cables, you can see the spare tracks are located right here on the lower hull plate. This is a unique bit of detailing found on this pattern of vehicle, and you'll see some more spare track links mounted on the pike nose when I go ahead and spin the model around to that portion, which, well, I think that's a perfect time to go ahead and do that. So, with the model spun around, you get to see the front detailing, and there's really not a whole lot going on up here outside of the kit supply detail. This would include the tow hooks, 
the spare track racks, as well as also the headlight siren and the really nifty little U-shackles found right there on the front fender. All our kits applied, and again, all are very nicely detailed and are very easily installed when the time does come. For the tracks, I like to install them at the very tail end of the build, as are most of the Pioneer tools that you see on my builds, and this allows you to thoroughly paint and weather them off the model to make sure that everything is the appropriate color and you make sure that all areas have been thoroughly painted. A lot of people out there like to install these on the model and then paint everything with the base coat and then go ahead with a paintbrush to try to go ahead and paint all these small little fittings over here. That is something that can be done. My opinion, it's a bit overly complicated and it's just easier to go ahead and paint them off the model while still on the sprues as opposed to the other method. While on this section over here, one modification I want to mention involves what I did to the siren. This is the kit supplied siren and it does have some nice geometry to it and the scale is also pretty good. However, one quirk that's found on the Timia kit is that it is just molded flat and solid. And this is a common quirk found on many other Russian pattern kits on the market from Dragon to Zvezda. I believe Trumpeter did this too if I'm not mistaken. However, on the Tamiya kit here, the piece is just molded solid and there is no funnel detailing present on the horn section, which obviously is a bit of a focal point specifically on this type of a fitting. On the model over here, hopefully this comes out in the light, but I actually went ahead and hollowed this section out with a Dremel in order to give it the cone type appearance which would be present on the real unit. The procedure is actually a fairly risky one because there's not a whole lot of room for error and if the builder is not careful, they can easily damage the horn beyond repair and if that happens, well, you're pretty much screwed. Fortunately for this one over here, I was able to do the modification without any sort of problems and the piece was then installed as you see it right here as the kit originally intended it. Once that little detailing is added, it does improve the model quite a bit compared to the stock original offering. But again, if you do not have the tooling or the skills required to do this procedure, you might just want to sit this one out and just build it with the out-of-the-box configuration. Another really interesting feature that is not intended to be built into the model, but it's one that can be added by the builder, is by making the front hatch functional. With the way the kit is designed, it allows you to position the hatch either in the closed or open state, and this is done with a little peg that's integrally molded on the bottom of the hatch. This type of feature is seen on many other Tamiya kits out there, and just like with those other Tamiya kits, you can actually hack the model by making the hatch functional by just, instead of gluing it in place, if you take a soldering iron and just slightly melt the tip on the inside on the reverse portion of the hatch, you could actually make the hatch fully functional as I've done over here. Now obviously there's nothing else going on in here, there's no interior or anything like that, but it's just a nice little interesting feature that I like to build on my model for, well, why not reasons. The piece opens and closes without any sort of issues, and again, you know, just an interesting feature to have built in. Moving rearward takes us to the engine deck, and this is a nice bit of detailing found on the model, and what you see here is all, again, stock to me, and there's nothing really much to be added to this section, because most of it's integrally molded on. The one thing I do want to mention, though, are with the filler caps, you'll notice I went ahead and weathered them in my usual configuration with the sweaty, drippy type effects, which obviously would be pretty commonplace on the real vehicle. The next thing I want to mention are the for external fuel cells that we have here. These are, are again kit originals, they go together very very well and are also very nicely detailed. The pieces are a multi-part assembly which is again quite customary for these type of fittings found on most of the Russian tank kits on the market. So this means that you are going to have some seams to contend with, namely a seam running across the two side sections where the two halves glue together. This is very easily polished away with a little bit of thick super glue, some sandpaper, and just a little bit of elbow grease. Once the pieces are thoroughly blended together, you can see that the model looks very good and seamless overall. Of course, with the filler caps themselves, I too added the spillage type effects. And as I frequently mention, when you're doing spillage effects like this, you want to be as random as possible with it. You don't want to have the same drip in the same location at the same length as this actually would probably be a detriment to the build as opposed to helping it. So when you're going through a build like this and you're doing the weathering, you want to be more spontaneous on exactly how the 
spillage would occur if did it you know go on one side both sides not at all you know it, this is open up to uh, artistic licensing but this is definitely something to consider last thing i want to mention on the fuel cells is on the inner portion of here we have these really cool little straps that are present they are integrally molded into the sprues and the builder does need to carefully remove them deburr them and then they just drop directly in place fortunately this is easily done but if someone is a beginner and they're not used to working with finely molded parts this is something that may lead to some problems and they can break these components during extraction and cleaning so this is something that again some care needs to be exhibited by the builder during this portion of the tank's construction and this leads us to probably my favorite portion on the entire Joseph Stalin 3 tank, and that is the boulder which is sitting on the tracks, i.e. the turret. Next to the pike nose, it's definitely one of the more iconic features found on this pattern of vehicle. And the Tamiya kit here did this exquisitely. I love this portion on the kit. It goes together very, very well, mostly effortlessly. I mean, that meme where if you take a Tamiya kit and you just shake the box and you open up and it's gonna be built, that's pretty much what you have here. The kit turret goes together very, very well with minimum seam lines. The only seam line to contend with is right here on the front trunnion section where the two halves meet. This is something that is very easily blended away with a little bit of thick super glue and just a little bit of stippling effects, and it just blends right into the remainder of the cast section that's present on the turret. There's also a little bit of seam line right over here on the bottom portion of this curve. And again, it's also easily blended in with just a little bit of super glue. The next thing to mention are all the little grab handles, which again is another iconic bit of detailing found on this pattern of vehicle. And these are all the kit supplied units, but again, just like with the other smaller fittings, this is where a beginner may have some difficulty with the construction because you have to carefully remove these sections off of the sprue and get them deburred. Also, the kit does not, I believe from my memory, give you any spares in order to complete these sections over here. So if you break one, you're pretty much going to have to scratch build a new one. Fortunately, it's easily built out of some wire, but this is something that the builder does need to pay attention to. On the model over here, the trick that I incorporated was I snipped the units off of the sprue with a clean cut snip. And then before cleaning them, I actually installed them to the turret. Once the super glue was fully set and the pieces were permanently on in place, then with some very thin and fine sandpaper, I just went over these surfaces over here and I was able to polish down the burr to a non-existent level, leaving for the end result that you see on this model. This is a trick that I've incorporated on a number of other builds, but on the Joseph Stalin 3 here, it's definitely one that may be worth looking into. The turret itself does have some smaller sub-assemblies to it prior to the installation, namely the trunnion section here of the mantlet. But before you can do that, there is this really nifty hinged plate that we have right over here and it is fully functional. Again, just follow the instructions and you should be good to go. Continuing takes to the top portion of the turret and everything you see here again is stock. The hatches give you the opportunity to render them in the open or closed state, but for this model here, I like to render my models all buttoned up and that's the condition that you see. Even though it's buttoned up, the interior periscopes are fitted in place and they have been painted in the condition that we have here where you see the prisms have been painted in gloss black. This again is another way to add a little bit of extra life to your builds. And not and it's not just true for this Stalin kit, but it's true for basically every single tank kit out there that has some kind of a little periscope prism detailing that is present. While on the rear portion of the turret, this takes us to one of the coolest aspects of the entire vehicle, and really any Russian tank for that matter, and that is the rear-mounted DSHK. The DSHK is the kit-supplied unit, as I mentioned before. However, here's what it looks like now fully painted and weathered. Of course, I weathered and painted in my usual format that I've mentioned on many other videos, where it's painted in flat black spray paint, and then I go ahead and add the distress look here with the use of dry brushing techniques. On the reverse side, you can see that the model has its spade grips painted. On the DSHK, they are a Bakelite type material, a red Bakelite material specifically, and so I went ahead and rendered it as I do on many of the other model weapon grips that are found on other models that are found on this channel. The other thing I want to mention is the ammo can itself. The ammo can was simply just painted and weathered to the configuration that we see here, and just like with the 
tow cables, I painted it with a different shade of Russian olive green compared to the remainder of the vehicle. This again is another way to add a little bit of extra character and pop to the build. These ammo cans, just like with whole armies, came in a multitude of different colors and again it's just an easy way to add a little bit of extra character and it's definitely something that would not be uncommon seen in real life. The next thing I want to mention is with the antenna base or for this kit here, the lack thereof one. On the JS3, there would be an antenna base emerging from this section here of the turret. However, on the Tamiya kit, the component for the antenna base is not rendered. On the Russian antenna bases, they are quite similar to what you would see on the German or the British antenna bases, which consists of a large molded rubber type component. So if you're working on one of these models and you want to add the antenna, Drilling a small hole and adding a wire in is not going to be sufficient in getting the detailing that would be required. And this is something that's going to have to be obtained by the builder, either as an aftermarket accessory or something that they may want to cobble or 3D print in order to get the proper look that they desire. For this model here, you'll notice I just simply omitted the detailing altogether as obviously this bit of equipment is something that is removable and it's something that is not necessarily inaccurate to have missing or absent from your build like I've done over here. Moving forward takes to the main barrel assembly and you can see here that it's your basic no frills plastic model barrel. Of course, this is a two part assembly, which means there is going to be a center seam to contend with by the builder. But fortunately, this is very easily done with just some thick super glue, some sandpaper, and just a little bit of elbow grease, much along the lines I mentioned before with the fuel tanks. The most intricate portion of the barrel to watch out for, of course, is the break right here on the end. Because there is some detailing found in these sections over here, this is where you are going to have to take your time when going through the seam removal process, but again, it's something that can be done with relative ease. And once it's completed, it leads for a nice seamless effect that we have here. There are aftermarket options available in case the builder just wants to swap the kit one out altogether and go with one of those other sources, but in my opinion, it's really not that necessary, specifically if you have a lot of experience with dealing with barrel seam removal. Of course, the unit can elevate and depress, and like I touched on before, has a really cool hinged plate that we have right here that follows the mantlet during its operation. On the mantlet itself, nothing really much to talk about. The kit is very, very nicely detailed with the fastener, the optic MG holes, and also with the cast texturing applied. Nothing was added to this piece over here, and the way you see it was literally left built out of the box. Of course, while on the mantlet, the one thing that I do want to mention is where the coax MG is located. And on the JS3, it's right over here with this larger hole that's integrally molded into the mantlet. Obviously, when it came time for weathering, just a couple little poofs of flat black were added to simulate the powder fouling effects that you see on the model. And on that note, this leads us directly to the paint and the markings. For the model's paintwork, I went with a different shade of Russian olive green compared to some of the other Russian builds that I've touched upon on this channel previously. This color over here I cobbled together from studying several surviving examples of preserved Russian military vehicles, as well as also from several wartime color photographs that I was able to track down and use as a basis to cobble this color that we have here. It is my own mix and the paint itself is just exterior latex that I had custom mixed for me at the Home Depot. As I often mention these videos, when you build a lot of models it's really good to go ahead and have your own custom mixes so that you can have basically an endless supply of paint which is great for large volume of builds and also larger scale builds both of which obviously you know is very relevant to me. For the weathering work this is done in my usual configuration with the uses of filters as well as washes. Both of these details were applied via the airbrush along with some counter shading which is again customary for my build. Also which is customary for my build is the distressed surface look that you see here and this is all applied via the dry brush and this is something that I do touch upon in a number of other videos. For the markings, I went ahead and utilized the kit supplied water slide decals. One cool feature that this kit does have is that it gives you the option to render this model in about two or three different configurations. For this particular build here, I went with the following format. The quality of the water slide decals were quite typical for what you see on Tamiya kits, which needless to say was quite excellent. The decals are really good quality, they went on without any sort of problems. And then once the decals were added in place, the entire model was sealed over with a coat of VMS matte varnish. 
I often mention this in a number of my videos, but it's for good reason. The VMS Matte Varnish is an excellent product, and it's a great way to add that very final finishing touch to your build, where it thoroughly seals over the markings, and it also just gives the model that finalized, polished, professional look that you generally see on a lot of builds out there. Also, I might as well point out, as I mentioned before, this is not the first time I've undertaken one of these Tamiya JS3 builds. In fact, I built one of these models many, many years ago, and that model was the subject of its own OTR rebuild video. And, well, I might as well go ahead and take the opportunity to have that model displayed on the table as well. So, now that the two are side by side, you can really see how much different the two examples look by just changing out the colors, the paint scheme, and also the different markings that were used on both of these builds. Which again goes to show you that if you just change out one or two aspects of your build, you can have two of the exact same kits and yet they will look completely different from one another and they will both be able to enhance your collection, giving it for a little bit extra differentiation. I also want to take the opportunity to mention that it's thanks to this build over here, which was how I was able to get this build fully restored to the condition that you see it here on the table. You see, as I mentioned in the rebuild video, there were many detail components that were either missing on this model at the project start, or they were just so heavily damaged that they were past the point of repair. And in order to get this one fully restored, I needed to take the components that were on this kit, make molds of them, and with those molds I was able to make resin copies that were then utilized to rebuild the model up to the condition that we have it here. This was done for, for instance, all of the swing arm components found on the suspension. There were some other surface fittings that this was also the case with, but most importantly, the DSHK was something that was a direct copy from this one here because the original one was lost to the sands of time. With the camera brought in nice and close, you will see that, or I should say you will not see that this unit here is a resin copy and the two units look completely indistinguishable from one another and well, that's really the point. In the end, I am really happy in how this build turned out. These Tamiya JS3 kits are excellent and they just build into such a nice representation of the vehicle in question. Just like with most other Tamiya kits out there, this one here goes together extremely easy and pretty much effortlessly. And having not just this one, but the older version that this build helped repair both housed in the collection is definitely something that I greatly appreciate. Which is a perfect point to slide us into skill level and recommendation. And as I just touched upon before, the Tamiya JS3 kit is a phenomenal example of a really nicely detailed, but a relatively easy model kit to assemble. So much so that I'm going to go ahead and say, yes, a beginner can theoretically grab one of these models and go ahead and build it and have some pretty decent results with it. This is not exactly something that I say very often at the end of these videos. Generally, I do the skill level recommendation. I say, oh yeah, it's a great model, but if you're a beginner, you know, maybe you want to pump your brakes a bit. However, for this one over here, that's not really the case. It just shows you the magic of Tamiya kits. They are well engineered, they are pretty simple, and you do get excellent detailing for you know the molding and details that are supplied. The only thing that I do want to stress for someone who's just jumping on one of these kits, you know, off the boat as they say, is you have to make sure that you pay attention to the swing arm placement, use that little kit supply jig that is mentioned, follow the instructions to the T, and also be very careful with the removal of some of the small little detail fittings that you see on the build. Things like the headlight, the grab handles, as well as the DSHK. If you're able to do that, one of these builds can be something that you can go ahead and build and honestly have it done probably within an afternoon or so. This kit here is really that simplistic. And obviously, if a beginner can theoretically tackle one of these models, someone who has the intermediate to the advanced range skill sets can tackle one of these builds without any sort of problems all day long. Now, generally, whenever there's a model that can be built by all of the skill set ranges that I generally mention, usually I say, well, you know, it's a rather simplistic build and a intermediate to an advanced range person is probably going to feel a little bored going through the motions of the build. However, for this example over here, that's just not the case. Not only is the build super simplistic, but the end results are excellent, which again goes to show you the quality of engineering that Tamiya puts into their kits. 
They're just great. There's no other way to put it. Now, if someone is a person that has a more advanced skill range set, the kit is far from being perfect out of the box. Obviously, nothing is truly perfection. And there are several ways you can improve upon the kit, but of course, this is all at the builder's discretion. One of the improvements that I cannot recommend enough, however, is the addition of the sponsons, like I touched upon earlier in this video. Like I stated earlier, these sponsons are the biggest weakness, in my opinion, that the JS3 kit here has, and it's something that once added, it really does improve the build immensely. Fortunately, the scratch building of these pieces here is something that can be done relatively easily. In fact, I already mentioned that I showed the format and the steps on how to go through the assembly method in the JS3 old tank repair video that again is referenced earlier and can be found on the video description. Aside from the sponsons, there are several other aftermarket options out there in order to enhance this kit further from the kit original configuration that you see here. Because this model has been on the market for as long as it has, there are a number of different options available in certain different medias in order to enhance the model further. Such examples would include sets made on photo etch, cast resin, turned aluminum, and you do have several other workable track link options which can be added to this model to improve it further. Is this something that is absolutely mandatory in order to build one of these models? My opinion, no. But again, if the builder so chooses to, they could take it to the next level by adding the various accessories that I just referenced. And of course, something like this is best left up to the discretion of the builder. One other attribute that makes this build such an attractive and exciting build for someone to add to their collection is just how easy they are to come by and, when found, are also really affordable. These kits have basically been in constant production since 1996, and because of that, finding one of them is ridiculously easily done, and, of course, when found, can be had without sacrificing an arm or a leg. Which, all things considered, these are a fantastic reason why you would want to add one of these kits to your collection. Which is a perfect point to swing us into recommendations. And as I just mentioned, because of the cost and availability of these models over here, they are a fantastic choice for anyone who's just looking to add number to their tank collection, as well as also a little bit of variety. On top of that, because of the subject matter, if you're a fan of Russian or Soviet pattern armor, and I know it's not really popular or it's a bit controversial to say at this time, but regardless, that is a aspect of model tank collecting. The JS3 kit here is a phenomenal choice to add to your collection. On top of that, if you're just a fan of World War II armor or even Cold War armor, the JS3 is one of those late vehicles that kind of bridges the gap between the two and would be a nice addition to add to your collection if you have vehicles like the M46 Patton or also the Centurion. I would also recommend this kit for anyone who's just a solid fan of the Joseph Stalin heavy tank. The Stalin series as a whole had a lot of very interesting and unique vehicles that were developed from the mid-World War II time frame and all the way up even into the post-war years. In recent years, many if not all of these mentioned vehicles have been developed and released in kit form by one maker or another. And if you just want to have a nice complete rounded collection, the Tamiya kit here is a phenomenal excellent choice to add. Which, given the quality of kits that we see being produced today, is something that is very, very noteworthy because of just how future-proof this old kit really, truly was. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale Russian Joseph Stalin III heavy tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale model builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.